All that and lots more still to come. We've got a host of opinionated guests ready to give us their thoughts, but we want to know what you think as well. That's right. I want to get you involved in our discussions. You can contact us by Facebook and Twitter. Don't forget to use the hashtag BBCSML or text SML followed by your message to 60011. Text a charge at your standard message rate or email us at sundaymorninglive at bbc.co.uk. However you choose to get in touch, please don't forget to include your name so I can get you involved in the show. Well, now let's get the show started. Let's uh, take a look at some of the talking points from the week. Taking a break from his tour, Profit Sharing, to join us is comedian Ashley Blaker. And also with us is the broadcaster and writer Nina Mishkoff. Hi. Uh, Nina, boys will be boys and girls will be girls, but maybe not when it comes to advertising. Well, no, not now. Um, apparently, the Advertising Standards Authority, which is the body which regulates, you know, broadcast and internet and all, all forms of advertising, has said that gender stereotyping has got to stop because apparently it's it's influencing and restricting uh, the choices of young people and adults. Like, for instance, showing you know a man lying on a sofa while a woman hoovers round him, or a woman failing to parallel park a car. So these these sort of images are are, are, are reinforcing, um, as I say, stereotypes. And, and I, I understand that, and I, and I think particularly in the case of children, uh, where you know little girls should not just be shown you know p pink fluffy ballerinas and unicorns and and. Um, and boys should not just be shown trucks and fire engines. So do we think this is a good thing? Sign of progress, perhaps? Well, well, it is a sign of progress, but on the other hand, you can take it too far. You've got to keep a sense of humour about this, because what... what well, you know more about humour than I do. I mean, you make your living <laughs> from it. But, 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 but stereotyping of a certain kind, stereotyping... Is, it's, because it's true, it's a, it's a truism. We, we do know that women do more housework than men, even yeah. in, in this day and age, which is shocking. Um, and, we, and we do know that, actually, it, it's been proven that women speaking very generally, have less spatial awareness than men. Oh, I don't uh, know. I don't uh, know. I'm quite good at parallel parking, uh, actually. Uh, I'm actually. not I mean, getting on. involved in that. Side. Can, can you park a car? I'm definitely not getting involved in that side. Of it. But, no, I, I agree with you, Nina. And the thing is, is that while it's clearly a good thing that adverts are not going to show women to only be interested in cleaning the house and men are only truckers who want to eat Yorkie bars. Um, if this had been in place many years ago, we'd have been robbed of the shaken vac woman. <laughs> it could have been the shaken vac man. No, yeah, exactly, and <laughs> brawny men in the back of vans singing we hope it's chips, it's chips, and things like that. And OK, that well, on, on the vein of gender stereotyping, mm. there's a story about a lovely girl called Evie, isn't there? Tell us about that, Ashley. Yeah, no, I saw this on Twitter. So this girl, eight years, eight years old, was yes. watching Horrible Histories on the BBC, and she saw an episode in which a character described the Vikings as great big girls. Right. because they wore makeup and apparently picked on easy targets. And she wrote to the BBC complaining that this was quite sexist, using great big girls as a pejorative term. And the BBC wrote back, uh, including an apology from the commissioning editor of what? Children's Television, saying they'll edit this out in the future. Which is, it's, it's extraordinary, but I'm actually more worried about if the episode is shown in Scandinavia and, <laughs> and any Vikings see themselves being called great big girls. Because they're not going to write to the BBC, they're going to be straight in the longboat, <laughs> sailing over here, and they've got weapons. So let's, let's have a look at the clip now. Those rough, tough Viking warriors like to wear eye makeup, neatly trim their beards, and have a good wash every Saturday night. And when they invaded Britain, they loved to pick on nice, easy targets like poor, defenceless monks. <laughs> Do you know, Vikings were basically just great big girls. <laughs> Well, they've taken that, that clip out. It sort of jarred a bit, didn't it, Nina? What do you it, think? It, it does jar a bit. I mean, but there used to be a, another expression, a big girl's blouse. You know, but we, nobody uses language like that these days. But you know, Well, we've got Evie here yeah. today, so let's have a little oh, chat fantastic. with her. She's with her lovely mum, Heather. There they are. Hey, Evie, this is such a lovely story. Tell us how it all happened. Uh. <laughs> or maybe mum can jump in. Well, she was just sitting down and she was watching the episode and she said, Mum... That's not right. They shouldn't say that. And so I essentially just said, well, what do you want to do about it? And I gave her some options, and one of them was writing a letter or just ignoring it and grumbling about it. And she chose to write the letter. Good for you. Evie, so. how did it feel when you got the letter back from the BBC? I was really excited because I didn't actually think they'd respond. But and, they did. And they responded. You're wearing your brownie uniform, aren't you? So you've got a special badge. Tell us about that and show us the badge. Um, uh... You had it <laughs> earlier. Just you just had it. It. <laughs> oh, here. So that's the badge. Tell us what that badge is and who it's from. Um, 
It's the speaking out virgin. It's from Brownie. <laughs> You're a very brave girl for speaking out. What would be your message to other girls that are watching you right now? We may be young, but we still have a voice. Do, do you know, I tried to speak to a lot of the, the BBC bosses and I never get through to them. You've got through to them with one letter. <laughs> I need to take a tip from you. Uh, I mean, Heather, what, what's she like at home? Does she write letters to you when she's un unhappy with things? Uh, she tends to be a bit more vocal with me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, yeah, she, you know, she... Uh, knows what she believes in and she stands up for what she believes in and doesn't tend to let things lie if she's unhappy with them. Um, you must be so proud. It's I been am. lovely to speak to you both. Thank you so Thank much, you. Evie, for sharing Thank your you. story. Thank you. Well done, and hopefully they won't be writing into Sunday Morning Live. I, I better be careful what I say. No <laughs> gender stereotypes on our show. So, Nina, I, I, Netflix, they've, they've come in for a bit of a roasting uh, for a programme that they call Historical Roast. Now, I, I wasn't really sure about it. It's a bit of an American thing, isn't it, roasting? Explain this story. Very much an American thing, and a, a roast is where they, um, they get um, somebody famous, somebody well-known in a room, um, and then everybody insults them, and this is supposed to be hilarious. So, like an interrogation? Type. No, no, they just, they just hurl insults. At them. <laughs> right. it's so it's been going for decades, and Joan Rivers, people like that, were all you know part of it. And now Netflix has got this historical roast series, and they've they've you know they've roasted sort of people from the past. And this time they've really really put their foot wrong here because the person they've roasted is Anne Frank, right? Mm. Which I mean, even I, I can't even use that the, the terms in the same sentence because it's just so repulsive. Um, they, they, you know, you you can. I think it's it's possible, and 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 it's and it's and it's and it's something very difficult. But they've 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 actually roasted Hitler in the past. Mm -hmm. But and 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 for instance, um, Mel Brooks did the producers, which was you know did their musical Springtime for Hitler. Um, Charlie Chaplin um, had the Great Dictator, which was in the in the in the middle of the war. But Anne Frank's is an iconic. A wonderful young woman who was who was killed by the Nazis, and she was a victim. And you don't roast victims. Yeah, actually, I can see you're chomping at the bits to get in. Let's have a clip and just actually see yeah. what was happening in that yeah. show. You might like to know that today your former hiding spot is a well-renowned museum dedicated to your life. It's the finest, most profound museum I've ever been to. But Anne, no offense, the gift shop sucks. <laughs> Six bucks for a bottle of water. Never again. Ashley, you're a comedian. Are there, are there some topics that we just shouldn't joke about? Because that feels a little bit crass. Yeah, I, I mean, I have very mixed feelings about this, because on the one hand, it does make me feel very uncomfortable, especially as a Jewish person. On the other hand, I haven't yet had a Netflix special. And I <laughs> don't want to say anything too strongly against them uh, in case they're watching. Um, but I, I agree entirely with what Nina said, actually. There's a huge difference between satirising people like Hitler and the Nazis uh, and a victim, because the victim's done nothing... Uh, I mean, that, that, he was well, a satirized. He's a Jewish man that presented. Yeah. Does he get a free pass? You know, if you're oh, criticizing your own so. race and your own religion, I don't think so. The only thing I, I can think in positive to say about it is that in a time of rising anti-Semitism, when there are still people who deny the facts of the Holocaust, any television programs that brings people to discuss that topic and research it themselves is, is a good thing. That's probably not the best way to do it, though, but that's one positive I can think of. I think of. it's a dreadful way to do it. There was a line in here, and I'll read you, where Hitler is seen... One actor says, Everyone knows you as a hero and a best-selling author, but to me you'll always be a little number 825060. Yeah, you, it's just You a absolutely bit can't. I mean, and if anybody's really. been to that Anne Frank Museum yeah. in Amsterdam and, and not wept as they've gone, mm. you know, come out of it... Mm. It's um, also worth saying, though, because I've watched a couple of them, but they do ridicule Cleopatra, Muhammad Ali, Martin, well, um, Martin Luther King, but to be fair, that is one of the other The other thing is we have a very different sense of humour. It's a, as Nina yeah. said before, it's such an American thing that I think as a British person, it's actually quite hard for us to get our head around the yeah. roast anyway. I've got to say, it was just pretty bad. I mean, I'm not going to get a Netflix series. It wasn't that was funny. The, that was the, the worst biggest crime. crime. It wasn't funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, talking of fun, let's move on, because I've got another story here. Actually, you're going to talk us through it. There was a fun story in the, a Canadian paper about plastic yeah. bags. Right. Let's, so, tell yeah. us about this one. So we all know that single-use plastic bags are bad for the environment. Yeah. There's five piece shopping bags here shopping bag charge here, uh, but one store in Vancouver in Canada has gone a step further. They produce these bags that are meant to have embarrassing slogans on them. <laughs> there's one, <laughs> Avoid the shame. ointment, there's Wait. another one, adult video store, 
Yeah. Can really... I just say they told me to pick this up? It's nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as embarrassing as having Sports Direct on your back, but <laughs> it's. But still, that's the idea of it. And but the, it's kind of backfired because people love them mm. and are buying them as collectors. And actually, are selling them online. Teenage I boys must find them hilarious, yeah. you know. Totally. But w what I don't understand is, it, apparently, they, the, the Canadians um, put on a, a five cent tax on their plastic bags, and that hasn't really worked. Yeah. I mean, whereas in this country, we've we've put ten p on a plastic bag, and it has. Worked. Maybe they may need to make it ten cents rather yeah. than ten, five cents. Well, also, anyone who's driven in North London or North Manchester will know this. So Orthodox Jewish men wear the big hats, mm. either the wide rim black hats <laughs> or the, the the furry ones. And they're very expensive, so whenever it rains, everyone rushes to get a plastic bag to put on their head. <laughs> I'm just concerned that there are going to be Orthodox <laughs> Jews in Vancouver now walking <laughs> around with this. <laughs> you wouldn't want to see your rabbi walking down the street with an adult <laughs> video store on his head. No, not no. a good look, is it? All uh, right, let's, let's talk about the Church of England, Nina. Um, a story you've seen about them this week. Yes, well, the Church of England's investment arm, and of course, I, you know, thinking back to my days in, you know, in primary school and bi Bible stories, you know, and, and Jesus and the, the money lenders and the temple and all of that, I'm quite, it's quite a thing for me to get my head round the, the, the church's investment arm, but it has got an investment arm and it's worth billions. 12.6 billion. Billion, unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, what do they do with it? I, I don't know. Anyway, they have now relaxed, relaxing their ban on medicinal cannabis, on, on investing in the production of, 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 of medical cannabis. And, and it's according to the Financial Times, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Yep. So they are, so, so they, they're, they're, what their argument is that it's legal. Um, and you know, so why not? And, and they they have they, they, been carefully restricted, etc., etc., etc. And they obviously are very careful about where they where they put their money. Um, although we don't know where you know the Catholic Church. There's been scandals in the past, um, so this is this is something that, something uh, different. Um, but they say that obviously lots of m m medical um, uh, products which would not be safe in in uh, in normal in normal life actually if people just took them like morphine you don't legalize that you don't put money into that should Ashley sorry Ashley should the church stay away from money altogether then well it's it's great I, it's extraordinary to think how this could happen I can only assume the Archbishop of Canterbury was watching Breaking Bad on Netflix yeah. and thought that uh, yeah. Walter White is making a lot of money here. <laughs> He's watching we've, Breaking we've, Bad. We've got to get in on this. this is <laughs> it's yeah. bizarre. There's but, got to be other ways to make money. But, but all all, religions, they, all the churches, they, they all have money, don't they? They have pots of yes, money. They've I got know, to but fund it, themselves. It, it seems it's almost uncomfortable. I'm not comfortable with it. I'm not comfortable with it. But also this whole thing about medicinal cannabis, there's not one single prescription been, been given since it was legalised last November. So you think, well, what is going on there? Why, you know, what's that about? Yeah. It's, it's, it's legal in California. Well, imagine you, everything's legal in California. Um, That's another story for well, another <laughs> week, I think, <laughs> 12 billion pounds makes me think I'm in the wrong religion. <laughs> That's extraordinary. <laughs> OK, now a, p a story about punishment in a playground, I believe. Yes, so this was a report about the, the um, British Psychological Society are saying that it is an infringement of children's human rights to be given detentions during lunchtime and playtime. And this is the idea that playing is such an important part of mm. child's development mm. that it would infringe their human rights. But... I mean, if, what's the alternative? You have detentions after school, that's an infringement of my human rights. Yeah. That I have to now go yeah. back yeah, to school I mean, and pick I, up my children. I mean, I remember when I was at school, a lot of the naughty kids, that they just needed to run around and get all that, lose all that energy. I mean, well, well, they need to run around, but, but the thing is, children not only need to know how to interact with other children and to, the skills that you learn in the playground, but they also need to know that there are boundaries, that there are limitations, and that there are consequences of actions. And keeping them... On but he's own. taking away their playtime, the way to do good, it. Good, good. They, they, they need to know that they are being punished. They need to... I don't think it sounds that draconian, but they you, need you to know that there are consequences <laughs> well, and that if they, if they persist, persist in that action, then this pleasure will be taken away from them. Not taken away from them forever, but for one day. Next day, they can go back in the playground. And you can talk about childhood obesity, you know, and they need to run around. We also then need to address what parents are doing, feeding their children junk food. So maybe there's another way to, to discipline the children. How? Mindfulness in schools? Mm -hmm. oh, well, uh, well, absolutely, mindfulness. Bizarrely, um, um, there, there, there are organisations that, that really help children to monitor their behaviour and, as you say, mindfulness. Um, yeah. 
Uh, and we're going to get detention if we carry on, because oh, we're out, <laughs> completely out of time. I'm going to put you in the doghouse. Now, but we'll end up with a good news story, as the first service since the fire of Notre Dame uh, has taken place. But the priests had to wear rather unusual headgear. Have a look at this. <laughs> <laughs> what do you make of that, Ashley? That's the the <laughs> world's worst village people tribute. <laughs> oh, no, I, I think it's terribly moving. Yeah. I really do. If you've ever been to Notre Dame, it is the most glorious place. Well, thank you for your contribution. Yeah, to thanks, great. both of you. Now, Simon Thomas was known to some as a Blue Peter and Sky Sports presenter, but he came to even wider prominence for tragic reasons when opening up about the death of his wife, Gemma, who passed away just three days after being diagnosed with leukaemia back in 2017. That left Simon alone to look after his young son, Son Ethan and ahead of Father's Day I went to meet him to see how life as a bereaved dad has changed him. Simon thank you so much for welcoming me into your home today. Pleasure. It's been 19 months now mm. since you sadly lost your wife Gemma. How have you been coping? If you'd asked me that question probably a year ago I'd probably say not very well but you know time when you go through something like this actually is not a healer as many people would tell you it's a changer. And we're in a far, myself and Ethan, my nine-year-old boy, we're in a far better and different place to where we were a year ago and where we were 19 months ago. You know, those first few weeks and months, I was an absolute mess. And how has Ethan been through that time? Because, you know, he was eight years old when he lost his yeah. mummy. How have you been as a team? He's been remarkable. Mm. You know, he has been. And his, the strength he's showed has, has massively surprised me. They often talk about children being a lot more resilient than we give them credit for, but it's only really when you see it, you realise how strong he is. What has happened with him and does happen with kids who go through this is in those initial first few weeks and months, incredibly expressive about what he was feeling. He would ask some incredibly tough questions. Mm. You know, literally days after she went, he asked me one early morning, what are we going to do with mummy's clothes? I haven't even began to think about that yet. Yeah. But that was an important question at the time. And I learned over time to go there with him yeah. on those questions. Because if you don't, you essentially close the door on those conversations. Because he goes, daddy doesn't want to talk about this. Daddy gets upset or angry. And they will stop asking. So I always went there with him, even if it was really hard. But it's lovely that he's almost a pillar of strength for you. Mm. How has your faith helped you through your grieving process? I think there's been times when it hasn't mm. because you have those times when you think it makes it almost more complicated. If that's just it, you know, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, that's it. Lights go out and that's it as far as life is concerned. You haven't got all that stuff to wrestle with. Like, where was God? Why did God not answer my prayers on that Friday not to let her go? Don't leave Ethan without a mum. Mm. And so in some ways it, it makes it harder because... You, you're wrestling with all these massive questions about, well, what exactly is my faith all about? Mm. Whilst dealing with the pain of losing someone, the maelstrom of emotions that come when, you, when you're grieving, and then the sheer worry about what life is going to look like for my boy, how are we going to do this together, what's the future look like? There were times I thought life would be a little bit, little bit easier if I wasn't wrestling with this. I, I just, from my point of view, I cannot imagine life now if there is no hope. Yeah. If that is it, as some believe, and I understand why they, for them, they, they can't go there with faith. That, that's it. When life ends, it ends. For me, it's like, I, I don't know how I begin to process this. If there is no hope, if heaven does not exist and there's no hope, I'll ever see Gemma again. But do you believe you will? Yeah. And, and my boy believes he will. Good. You know, he, he, we've never indoctrinated him. We've never told him this is what you have to believe. He's just grown up in a house where God was part of life where we'd go to church, some of our closest friends were Christians, not all of them were, yeah. uh, and he's just been part of the conversation. And he was a, you know, Gemma's faith was a massively important part of her life as well. He does have a conversation with her at bedtime every night now. He That's does. a new thing, and he wanted to do it. And he holds a little wooden cross that was given to him by our vicar, David, in, in the days after Gemma went. She died holding a wooden cross, and he holds it in his hand, and he talks to mum. And he'll say really mundane things like, oh, mom, dear mummy, Today I did this at school, I went on a play date with Louis or, or this and or me and Daddy did a fun run today um, and we miss you, love you, amen. Isn't and that then I have, to, I have to do it as well. Do you have to do yeah, it Yeah, I have to do it. And then I say a prayer. So we end the day like Mummy used to always end it. Same routine if I was around, I put him to bed, 
mummy comes up and says a prayer and that was it. But we've carried it on, it's just very different. It's almost like the end of one chapter and the start of another. Mm. How have you found life, just the two of you? I, I just felt as time went on, we've got two choices here. We either remain stuck and believe that life can never be good again. It's always gonna be some pale gray version of what it was before, or we find life again. And I thought, I've got a boy yeah. who still smiles, who still laughs. We still had some amazing experiences in that first year. And I think it was the moment he was mascot for England in March of 2018. And the, the FA very kindly let him be a mascot. And he led England out first. And I remember standing there and watching him and just this, these two separate things were going on. On the one hand, the most proud moment to see your boy walk out first with the England captain for the night, Eric Dyer. Okay. The roar of Wembley Stadium, seeing the look of awe and wonder on his face and shouting to him. So I was standing by the tunnel, Ethan! And he sort of smiles. He saw you. But then accompanied with that was the pain of thinking, but she should be here to see it. And he said to me on the way home, Dad, I just had the most amazing night but I feel so sad that mum was here to see none of it. And it was kind of a, a moment where I just realised, you know what, for me, but especially for him, this is life going forward. We have to accept now that when we have those good times, when he reaches those milestones in marriage, you know, of marriage maybe for him, yeah. of leaving school, of, of hopefully passing exams and maybe graduating, whatever they might be, those moments can still be amazing moments. Yeah. But we have to learn to accept the two of us. They'll always be accompanied by the pain of Gemma not being here but life can still be good again. I just thought somehow in the grimmest, darkest of places, I'm gonna find the light. What was the impetus in writing the book? I set up this blog site, never blogged in my life, called it A Grief Shared, and started writing blogs. And for some reason, I don't know why, but they, they resonated with people. And I wrote one particularly on my battles with mental health that were happening before Jim had got ill. Yeah. And by six months on from that, I don't know what a lot of the, the figures mean on it, but over a million people have been through. And I thought for some reason, the way I'm writing, what I'm writing about, writing about really difficult areas that lots and lots and lots of people have to deal with and are going to have to deal with at some point in their lives, particularly grief. Mm. Maybe I should write a book. And I thought, let's do it. And then a publisher came you know, and sat down with me around this kitchen table and said, we want to write it. It's amazing. It. Yeah. Because you, you, know, you funneled that energy mm. into something really positive that really will help people. Yeah. Yeah. in dealing with this. And that's what I want to do. It's like I have no magic answers in terms of how you deal with grief. I really don't. Gemma's story is sadly not unique. I mean, it's quite shocking the speed of it. I think it's most traumatic. people feel with cancer yeah. that even with cancer, yeah. you get time to prepare. Yeah. We, did, we didn't. Mm -hmm. But I just, I just think, I'm, I'm really sorry to say this, but as a country, we are still rubbish at talking about grief. It's, we just don't want to think about it. We don't want to, we know we're all going to go at some point, but we shy away from it. And I, I kind of wanted to help people understand a bit more what it's like and actually give people a sense of hope that however dark the depths can feel, even in some of the darkest places in space, there are still shards, atoms of light, that there is light to be found in the darkest of places. And it's just to give people a sense of hope that it is possible to find a way through something like this. Simon Thomas finding the positives after that tragic loss. Now, it's not often that Madonna and the Pope are singing from the same hymn sheet, uh, but that happened this week uh, when they warned of the dangers of social media. Speaking at the Vatican, the Pope said, the more we use social media, the less social we are becoming, warning we have developed a culture of insults. Well, Madonna had this to say on Friday night's Graham Norton show. There's something called social media. Yes. You know, that terrible dragon that flies over everyone yeah. and takes over their lives. Um, and that affects my older children, obviously. So, do they have a point? Does social media make us worse people? Or is it a vital tool to bring us closer to our fellow man? Joining us now to give us their views are Riyad Khalaf, a YouTuber, writer and broadcaster, journalist Nina Mishkov. Mina Dennert is a Swedish journalist and founder of the hashtag I Am Here campaign. And Tom Slater is deputy editor of Spiked Online. Well, Tom, mm. uh, so we've heard the Pope, Madonna, and a consensus of, <laughs> of harm of social media. They're, they're speaking out against it. Does it really make us worse? 
I don't think so. I think there's a tendency of any new technology to kind of blame it for what we see mm. to be society's ills, you know. And I think a lot of the things that social media gets accused of causing kind of already exist in society anyway. So mm. people talk a lot about echo chambers. Say, after the EU referendum, there was a lot of Remainers, particularly in the media, who said, we didn't see this coming. And when you don't tend to know a lot of people who um, have the opposite political view, you tend to be a bit more intolerant. You tend to react in a slightly outsized way. And yet people who've looked into this, one of the data crunches on the Remain campaign wrote an article making this point. Actually, Remainers are very concentrated. They tend to be in the cities. They don't tend to know many Leavers, whereas Leavers tend to be spread across the country. So I mean, the point I'm getting at is that it's not technology that is making us rancorous. I think a lot of the time it's just providing an outlet for a lot of, you know, things that are already there. Yeah, I mean, this goes wider than Brexit, and we don't want to get into of course, a political no. debate. But, but, it, but it, people say things on social media that they wouldn't say to your face. I mean, what about that point? I think there is an element to what, you know, certain social media platforms enable certain types of um, behaviour. For instance, I think Twitter has got twice m as more civil since they just upped the characters to 280 <laughs> characters. In 140 <laughs> characters, all you can really do is call someone a name in some respects. So I think these things do have a bit of an effect, but at the same time, I think um, we can also deal with these platforms. We can know what they are, we can know what you're getting when you get onto them, and I think the alternative, which is panicking too much, is not necessarily the best thing. Judging by Nina's face, she's going to be sending you some rude messages <laughs> well, on well, I mean, no, no, I, 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 th I think it's really sad that people sit there on their own insulting other people. I mean, if you're going to be insulting other people, then be paid to be a critic. Um, but do you blame it on social media, or is that just people Social media has given people a voice. Social media, people, social media has given people an outlet, a chance to be heard, which they never had before. Um, and that's a wonderful thing. There are wonderful things about the internet that, you know, it, it means we have access to information instantly, we have access to other people the other side of the world. I mean, I don't think you, you were old enough to remember what it was like before mobile phones. <laughs> so you don't know, you can't, you can't, I'm, I'm not, it's not your fault, I mean, you can't, <laughs> you, can't, you can't compare what life was like before then because you can't mm. begin to imagine it. Um, so it was but, a better world, was it? No, then? it wasn't a better world, it was a different world. But, th but this world, uh, you know, what I, what I find difficult about it is that people on their mobile phones um, shut out the world, shut out, they think that it's a tool to communicate, but people are communicating less on a human level. Mm. There's less actual human I interaction. People, people are yakking all the time on social media, but they're not saying anything. They're not, they're not communicating on a, on a proper level. What, what do you think? Are you, you well, know, social? Because you've built a career. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'd like it, but pays the bills. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, uh, I'm around long enough mm. to know what it was like before mm. and after, and. Uh, I can see the benefits of both, but you know, for me, when I first went online on dial-up internet, remember, like, ee, oh, you'd have to, <laughs> and the mum goes on the phone, it cuts out. Um, it was difficult. Uh, there was a lot of hate online. There was no sort of uh, online culture of, of openness, and, and this is what you do and don't say. And you know, it drove me offline for many, many years. I was on YouTube making videos, and these these trolls got me. Um, but I don't and, but understand then I how people care came, about it. No, no, I don't but then I came you back. care about what other people say if you don't know them or you don't yes, respect them. Yes, but if them. you're 16 years old and they're giving you debt threats every day, that's different. That's you, different. you change your views now. You're earning money. Yes. So I sort of <laughs> <laughs> reclaimed, <laughs> reclaimed the platform. No, but also I use uh, my social media and my YouTube channel and all of my work to reach young people who can't be reached in person. So young LGBTs uh, in the depth of Arkansas where they've got a homophobic father and mother and they own the only outlet or, or a feeling of family that they have is on Twitter Instagram YouTube and and that sort of saves lives so there's a good aspect too yeah and I mean the, the, the bad behavior on, on social media has inspired you to do something about it tell us what, what you've done I, I've been focusing on the politically motivated hate you're talking about professional trolls that are actually they're spreading disinformation and they are also targeting journalists or politicians or people of color or women are also more targeted than others so, so, uh, so what, and what, did, what have you done Explain. so what I did was that I started counter speaking and uh, I started at first I was just like blocking anyone who was writing racial slurs or uh, hate speech and um, but then I started to, to talk back or just ask them questions. So this is the hashtag I am here. Yeah, so what I started you mean? So you first. You've messaged them messages, positive messages, someone who's... No, it doesn't ne necessarily hate. need to be positive but it's just uh, like speaking my own, mm. saying my own truth or speaking my own fact, saying, <laughs> just sharing what I think or what I feel about and, things. And you're one of many now, you've set up this organization so there's lots of you doing it yes and now we're almost 150,000 people so, all over so how, how does it work so if I put online to Tom I said no, I hate you and you're you're never coming to <laughs> Sunday morning live again what, what, do you, what would you what would you say yeah okay so in the uh, we're 
were organized in groups on Facebook, and we uh, anyone who is in the group can uh, send a link to the group when some like, comment field has uh, gone out of hand. Right. And so, of course, we uh, um, differ between uh, opinions and hate speech. Mm -hmm. And if there's a lot of hate speech, we uh, try and go in and have a like more uh, nuanced I, debate. I think with my trolls, I've, I, when I respond to them with "I love you," <laughs> they, they could say, "You're awful. We hate mm. you. You're, you know, you're disgusting as a, you know, gay person, whatever." I just go, "I love you," and they always write back and they go, "I was just having a really bad day. I didn't mean it. I actually really like your work." And it's like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> all right, let's get another view from this. Let's go to Ria, who's with some guests on the piazza. Thanks, Sean. Well, I'm with Leilana Shuley now. Leilana, you and your family run the Tea Terrace Cafe in London, don't you? Yes, indeed. And this is quite a unique cafe because you provide these boxes where people can literally lock away their phones. Yes, indeed. And just enjoy an afternoon tea. Exactly. OK, let's have a look at one. All righty, so this is the lock. Only the staff have access to it, the keys, so we take your phone. <gasps> I'm going to yes. take part in the experiment today and put my phone in there Indeed. for the rest of the day and see how I get on without using social media. You're very okay. brave, I have to say. Uh, we keep the boxes on the table, mm -hmm. so they're rest assured that if anything goes wrong, they do have access to it. Um, but yeah, it eliminates all distractions. And what inspired you to do this in the cafe? And what have people's reactions been when they are asked if they want to put their phone in a box? Yes, so, well, basically, in the restaurants themselves, we do get a lot of families with young kids, with teenagers, um, and we've heard a lot of complaints walking around the restaurant put your phone down. This is a family time. This is a time to catch up. Right. So we, we wanted to really eliminate all those distractions. So we do give the option for our guests to put in their phones and lock those all away. And how has it changed behaviour since she's introduced this? It's crazy. It's like we've gone back in the old times, you know, where the, the people would just talk to each other and really enjoy it. I mean, the cafes themselves are buzzing nowadays. Like, Cool. Yeah. Love it. Right, well, I'm going to move on. You enjoy yes. your tea. Thank you. I'm going to talk now to Ezra and Charlie. Hi. Hello, ladies. How are we doing? Good. How are you? Now, Ezra, you're a travel blogger and you use social media loads for your travelling mm. to promote where you are in the world. Yeah. How important is social media to you? It's great because it gives the people the ability to check in on me and to see what I'm seeing. So they're sharing that experience of the travel and the destinations and all of that. But how would you feel about putting your phone in there today? Does it give you the heebie-jeebies? Um, if, for an hour or two, it's fine. But then it, when it's longer, this is when I start to worry about connecting with people. How long could you cope without your phone? This is the question. Oh, like a day. A day? I think. Oh, my goodness. Charlie, <laughs> you're a pastor at the Hillsong Church in London. Yes. How do you use social media for the ministry? Yeah, we use social media to help people to experience our church. We use social media to let them know what's going on midweek, when our services are, where they can get connected. Do you stream live from Facebook? We do on Facebook you occasionally, do? yeah. We do oh, things quite like nice that. nice if you can't make it down for yep, the service. Yeah, absolutely. YouTube, all those sorts of things. That's quite innovative. And um, what do you think about the darker side of social media? Do you think maybe it's replacing human connection? Are yeah. people suffering as a result? I think it's a tool, good or bad. I think some people do use it for bad and at the... Um, you know, at expense of themselves. Mm. And I think that people are um, losing social connection if they're using it for their social connections. Mm. I think you lose face value when you're not having a conversation like this. You don't see someone's body language and stuff now, like that. Now, you two met so. today for the first yeah. time and you've both took, taken part in our experiment. You put your phones in the box, which is fantastic. How has it felt just to meet face to face with a stranger? It's really good. It's nice. We've been having good chats. It's refreshing, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Maybe there's a sign of changing times. Back to you, Sean. <laughs> Certainly is, uh, Ria. I must confess I've got my phone behind this sofa. <laughs> I, I, I can't keep it far from me. Uh, let's get really serious about mental health here, Tom. Mm. A government report has said the impact of social media and screen time on young people's mental health links uh, the links between increased social media usage and mental health disorders. Mm. That's serious stuff here, isn't it? Well, it is, but then I think we also need to make sure that we're reading the evidence properly because Tom Chivers wrote a good piece about it on so Unheard a little while ago. There are some links, but often the kind of percentage relationship is often quite marginal. It's often quite negligible. And even when the um, House of Commons Committee did a report in social media earlier this year and they put out their report in January, they made the, the main point they made was that there really isn't enough evidence out there to make a, make a kind of call either way. I think a lot of what's driving the concern about social media is concern not necessarily about social media, but other things, trends in 
in society, trends in politics, a general kind of technophobia. You. You're, you're, a you're, you're just doing this blanket, you know, sort of um, support for for social media. Look at look at look at the lives of teenagers, which, as, as you mentioned, there's an enormous amount of pressure that comes on young girls in particular, looking at uh, Instagram accounts uh, with impossible beauty that's that's retouched beauty that they can never that constantly being um, compared to. Visions that they can't, they can't... But that's, but, that's, but, that's, that's the real world as well. But, but, but that's, that's all I'm saying. Not in the, but but it's, not, it's not so much. And, and here the, th the thing is, when you have a mobile phone, you think it connects you with people. It cuts you off yeah. from reality. But it's all about balance, isn't it? So if, but, if but I ate 50 kiwis balance. a day, it wouldn't but give people, me the benefits of vitamin but C. But, but young kids are on social media a lot, isn't that the problem? The problem is that we fling these children into the digital world with no training. There's nothing in school. They learn about play tectonics before they learn how to be safe online. And I think the school system has a part to play in making sure you know when is too much social media, what is the language you should and shouldn't use online, and how do you use it for good? How do you connect in, in a positive way? Take out the malicious aspect of attacking people uh, and use it for positive. Well, well let's, let's find out what those young people and some older people are saying on social media. Yes, lots of people get engaged online. Barb's has said it's opened the world up to new friends across nations, no matter what race or religion. That can't be a bad thing in my eyes. Liz has said people are getting too lazy to meet and talk face to face now or even over the phone. Younger people aren't learning proper social skills. And Stephen said, people are way too easily offended. You can't say anything now without offending the hashtag snowflakes. OK, so <laughs> thanks, Ria. Uh, I'm Mina, yeah, so, yeah, so Stephen says that... It's actually Stephen's our director's name. I wonder if he's just typed <laughs> in that. Um, but so Stephen has said that uh, actually people, you can't... People, just, uh, people are offended about everything these days. They're, they're snowflakes. What, what do you make of that? I mean, we, we are offended about lots of things, aren't we? Yeah, uh, maybe we are, but uh, I, I, it doesn't... The hashtag is not about that. The hashtag is about talking your own, speaking your own truth, and speaking up for yourself and standing up for what you believe in. And uh, what it is that we have seen is that the the trolls are targeting people. So they're targeting politicians and journalists, and they dare not do their jobs. And politicians quit their jobs as well. And uh, so it has consequences. And I mean, you have seen it here in. In Britain, with the with the Brexit campaign, mm. like how you can actually use the internet uh, uh, and social that. media. I for, know, uh, yeah, and I know you'd like to say lots of things. But you're going to have <laughs> yeah. to carry this debate on social media. <laughs> and no <laughs> negative comments from either of you. Please <laughs> keep it keep it yeah. safe. Um, but that's all we've got time for. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. There are said to be nearly 9 million adult carers in the UK looking after loved ones living with an illness, disability, mental health problem or old age. Today marks the end of Carers Week UK, which aims to help carers connect with each other and combat the isolation they can feel. Uh, this week, I went to meet two families who formed a special bond in a rather unexpected way. Jack Frimston is every bit the rock star. We thought living was good last year, but you guys, you've come out in the rain and you're having a good time. That's what we like to see. And his band, The Taylor Made, are on the up. But away from the stage, Jack cares for his mum, Estelle, who lives with multiple sclerosis. Jack's not known any different. Jack used to make sure I was OK. He used to cook. If you needed washing. I think I was just quite self-sufficient for myself and it was kind of a, a lot of that. So you, do you know what I mean? It was kind of do little bits for you around the house and stuff, yeah. but also being self-sufficient and just being kind of a, a mature kid who just kind of cracked on. Due to his bond with his mum, Jack was more than willing to accept an invite to a special occasion. And they were like, why don't you come along to the MS Awards and just meet some people with MS? And we sat on this table. But unbeknownst to him, one of the winners that night would inspire his latest song. This year's Carer of the Year award goes to Mary Nixon. She got up and she just gave this beautiful speech and I, I swear there was not a dry eye in the room. Caring stuff, it's just what we do, carers. It's you get up, you get on, you have a laugh, you fall down, you get up. As long as we stick together, that's the main thing. Yeah. I love that it's what we do and then after what we do it kind of I was thinking like team of two. It was beautiful. It's really beautiful. And I think that we're a team of two as well. 
The couple who inspired the tune are Mary and Stuart Nixon. I wanted to find out what that night meant to them. So you've been named Carer of the Year, haven't you? What was that like? It um, was a very emotional day to actually win it was quite unbelievable mm. that somebody thinks... Oh, I'm getting emotional, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. is, that, is that... You must have been so it proud, says. mustn't you? Oh, I, I was completely blown away. <laughs> One of the proudest moments of my life. So what does it actually mean being a carer on a day-to-day -day basis? We, we care for one another, we share with one another. If I need help, Stu helps me. If Stu needs help, I help him. Stu's, the help Stu needs will be different to what I need. So some days he'll need a hand getting out of bed. Some days he can do it on his own, some days he can't. It's no one day is the same really, is it? No, um, no, it's not. Mary spends far more time helping me than I ever do helping her. But thankfully we have a relationship which says, do you know, that's okay Just because... The one thing you can't do is arrange the weather. I know. It's no, raining. Should we go in? I think, I think, think we should go in. I think yeah. so. <laughs> Come on, then. Love it. This is back on. How important is it to, to raise awareness for long-term conditions? It is important, um, and that includes carers as well. Helping people connect to help some of those issues is really, really important. It's that caring connection that's proved so important for both Jack and Mary. So I wanted to organise a special performance while I was with them. Now, you know Jack, don't you? You yeah. sort of bonded as carers, haven't yeah. you? Yeah, something in common. There's something about carers you do click. That they, It doesn't matter what age you are, there, there is just something. It's that shared experience, it is. isn't it? But he's right. never been to the house, has he? He hasn't been to the house. Well, he's but... here today. Oh, he's just outside, Jack, come in. There he is. On his way in. <laughs> oh, my crying. There he is. <laughs> All right, cry again. Hello, mate. How are you? All good? Oh, lovely. Lovely. Nice to see you. What's it like to see him? Lovely. It's really, really nice. And you've written a song, and, and the words are particularly relevant to, to their experience, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, uh, seeing Marie up there kind of accepting her award for Care of the Year, who kind of, all, all these kind of, the words in her speech just rang true, and I was like, right, there's definitely a song in that, and it inspired me. Well, I'm glad somebody remembered because I can't remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, it's Mary and Stuart's chance to hear the song live with Jack for the first time. This one's for you guys. Oh. All right, this one's called Tima 2. You can take the coat off my back. Don't need the roof on your house. Darling, I will keep you sheltered, keep you covered up until the sun's out. I'll pick you up when you fall. I'll make your breakfast the same. I'll make you laugh in the morning over nothing, give it's one of those days. And when you get down. I'll be around When you've had enough I'm gonna step up I'll give you nothing but love Throughout the rain You're my sunshine You're the thing that's pulling me through I'm always thinking of you I'll see more too Hold me all oh, you It's just What we do Oh, so lovely. I'm crying oh, again. That's Thank you, Jack. I love you. A special moment and hopefully inspiration for carers everywhere. It's just What we do 
There were a lot of tears, such a moving story and a privilege to witness that performance. Well, the story uh, we just heard is only one of millions about people who dedicate their lives to looking after loved ones. Here to discuss some of the issues behind uh, caring is Corinne Pilling from Livability, a Christian charity with care homes and support centres across the UK. Corinne, well, thanks for coming in. Thank you. Uh, I, I mean, you know, some cultures and religions place the emphasis on the family looking after vulnerable people. I, is it the family or state that should be uh, shouldering the responsibility? Well, we're at a stage in our society where, in a way, it needs to be both. And on the one hand, we have huge challenges in, in meeting the care needs and funding social care. But on the other hand, I think, with um, the way things are shifting in our society and we've got this growth of more single-person households, we need to start to, I think, to reimagine what care can look like and how we can be all involved in that piece. It's not something that you know, necessarily should be just farmed out professionally, but we need to think a bit more about how we're doing it as communities, as families, in, a, in the broader context. I mean, I was looking at the figures, it's astonishing. Uh, the carers save the economy £132 billion a year. I mean, that puts Brexit into perspective. It's much less than that. That's right, £132. And I think it's really important to recognise that, you know, unless we're investing in carers, then we'll see, um, we'll, we'll see the figure increase in terms of the impact on services. And so I think there's, there's a pragmatic reason, but also I think at the heart of it, uh, we need each other. We're, we're made to be like that. And Livability is a Christian charity. We're particularly interested in helping faith communities um, really strengthen their, their support and their response and, and ensure that carers are more visible, that they are the people perhaps in church that might not be seen week to week, but um, perhaps every church can be in a position where they can start to look out and say, if you're not there, we're going to be people who will, will follow you up and will uh, we'll ensure that you're included. Corin, really good to talk to you. Thanks very much. Now, you may have noticed the Cricket World Cup is in full swing, but today in Manchester sees arguably the most highly anticipated match of the tournament so far, India versus Pakistan. Two countries often seen as divided along religious and political lines, with nearly a billion people worldwide expected to watch. To mark the occasion, members of the local community near where the game is happening are putting on a cricket match of their own. Raphael Rowe went to meet them to gauge the atmosphere ahead of the big game. <laughs> India and Pakistan don't always have the best of relations. So when the two countries meet on the international cricket field, the stakes are very high. That's mirrored at a local level too, here in Manchester. Pakistan! Zindabad! Just down the road from Old Trafford, where the World Cup match will be played, they're preparing an India-Pakistan community showdown. The rivalry is huge. You'll see yourself. Pakistan versus India creates the most excitement. So who are you here supporting today? We're supporting India. India. What do you think about the idea that this has been put on today as a community game between the two countries? Everyone come together. But what we need to remember is it's a healthy rivalry. It's an exciting rivalry. We need to bring these communities together so we are closer. We are friends. It's typical English cricket weather, overcast with a threat of rain. But that hasn't put a dampener on the spirits here. Making up the two teams are Indian and Pakistani players who all play in local cricket leagues in Manchester. The idea is to mark the World Cup, their love of the game, and to celebrate the power of sport to unite. I'll stay on that side. I'm going to go around, yeah? Ishmael is a fast bowler and captain for the Pakistan 11. He balances his serious devotion to cricket with his faith. How do you see the rivalry, the, the religious and political rivalry between the two teams? I think, I think it's always there, it's always it's, it's going to stay there as it is. And why is it important that India play Pakistan in the community, in a game of cricket? What are you hoping to achieve? I think it's, it's bring the community together. Uh, first of all, because we live in, in a multicultural community and living away from our home, uh, it just because of cricket is in our blood and we want to express ourselves through that. What will happen at the end of the game if India win the game between you guys today? I think we will shake hands and we will move on and we will pray for our, our Pakistani team to win on the Sunday. The largest religion in India is Hinduism. Shikara Savasalam, who is Hindu, moved to Manchester just three years ago. He's a batsman for the India community team. Like any, any game we play, we want to win this game. But because it has that additional tact to, tact to it in terms of India 11 versus Pakistan 11, 
I mean, it's that uh, feeling of you know getting on top and winning the game. And how do you think that will will build bridges between the communities mm -hmm. and the differences that they see? Cricket is a game where you're you're tough on the field, but off the field, you try to make as many friends as possible, and that's what I think this game today would also be about, um, where you play hard in the pitch, but outside the game. You, you try to be friends. Who's going to win between India and Pakistan today? I think the team that I play for should win. Yeah, yeah, India, <laughs> India. India is a more religiously diverse country than Pakistan. Captain of their community team is Philip Simon, a born-again Christian. He believes cricket can be a great way to bring people of all faiths together. We are a very diverse cricket team. We have uh, uh, Hindus, Muslims, Christians and Sikh, uh, different religions. It, religion really doesn't matter for us. When it comes to the cricket, we all are in the same boat. Brilliant piece of fielding. Excellent. India is on 23 with 18 overs left. The game's begun and the two teams are now playing on the field. And the two guys I met, one at the temple and one at the mosque, are out there bringing their communities together regardless of their differences. But it's not always the same at the international level. Shura Sharma is a cricket fan and presenter of BBC World Service weekly radio show Stumped. I do think that sport unites, not just, you know, matches like these, but around the world, everywhere, all the time. And uh, that ought to be taken as uh, a lead in trying to bridge these gaps uh, that unfortunately still exist. But before the match, yes, there's a lot of hype. And like I said, there's a bragging right involved. So both the teams and the nations tend to be very concerned about who's going to win or not. And there's a lot of pressure from uh, the people. And there's a, there's a lot of people in that part of the world. But on the ground, I think it's, it's still uh, very muted. This, this rivalry is, is more friendship than anything else and I think that translates to the people as well. Everybody wants a better environment and atmosphere between the two nations and sport, to my mind, invariably helps. Back at the local match, the community Bonhomie is warming up nicely, but the weather is not behaving itself. Unfortunately, rain has stopped play. But what struck me today was that I met two men who may come from countries that are divided, both religiously and politically. But ultimately, they're two devout men who love cricket. And that love of cricket extends to the younger generation, even in adverse conditions. The organisers declared the match an honourable draw. But there was a winner. Community spirit. It's not about winning or losing, it's just about, you know, as a community, yeah, bringing the, community bringing the together. communities together, yeah. you know. This is what we want you to, yes. to bring in the community yeah. Yeah. together, and that's, yeah. that's really good. Well, well then all the best yeah. for the all Sunday the game. Sunday's game, And yeah. see who's win there. All Maybe right. the best players win. Maybe the I think best the team Pakistan, win, yeah. Makes, I think uh, Pakistan will come yeah, in. Very in good. Uh, Let's hope for a good game. Uh, 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 yeah, and yeah, yeah and we we'll deserve team We'll see that. Well, maybe a draw might keep both sides happy. The region that sits in both India and Pakistan is Punjab, the historical homeland of the Sikhs. This month, Sikhs honour Guru Arjan Dev, their fifth guru. Now, he completed the holiest place of worship, what we now know as the Golden Temple, and was the first guru to die for his faith. As part of some Sikh festivities, one of the more eye-catching elements is a form of martial arts called Gapka. Earlier today, we got a sense of what it's all about. Well, our Steve, it looks and sounds really impressive. But what exactly is Gatka? Well, Gatka is a Sikh martial art. It started about 400 years from now. And it was actually after the fifth guru, Rajan Devji, was martyred on a hot iron plate that his son, the sixth guru, then decided that we need to stand up for the injustice that's happening. So then he introduced the Miri Piri. He wore two swords representing saint and soldier. So a Sikh must meditate at the same time. He must learn self-defense. And that's when he took upon the army of Sikhs and fought four battles all for the injustice that was happening. And that's where the actual Gatka started, yeah. So there's a real spiritual side to Gatka too, isn't there? Oh yeah, there is. You see, we see the weapons as Guru itself, Guru as in God itself. 
So before we even start the Gatka, we do ardas as in a prayer, asking for permission, so saying we're about to lift the shastra, the weapon, so please be with us all the time and guide us on the right path. So in that sense, yeah, it is very spiritual and physical martial art. Uh, and tell us about the net, because uh, it's quite confusing what's going on. And what's that uh, as a weapon? So the net actually has two aspects to it. The first one is that you can see it's obviously protecting the person's body. So any arrows, any weapons that are coming towards you won't harm you. The one we have over here is actually strings, but the ancient ones were made out of steel and they had fire on the end of it. So there's no way you could get close to the person spinning it. The second aspect is actually it works like a trap. So you're able to throw it onto the other person and trap them and then take them down. And what's the spiritual significance of this weapon? So this is called the dong. dong. Right. It's a wooden stick. And uh, the key thing with this is, unlike other weapons, it works both ways. So you can hit on both ends of the weapon. And it's all purely made of wood, pure wood, and it's just as deadly as a sharp sword. It looks oh, it. Okay. Yeah. Not as deadly as those swords, actually. <laughs> Tell us about those. I mean, oh, the guy's got a sword, there he's got two. Oh, yeah. the girls, the girls. So it's that's, a girl, sorry. Yeah, that's yeah. a girl yeah. doing I, I like to say, it's nice to see that the girls are getting involved as well. Have women yeah. always traditionally been involved in gangsters? Yes, actually, back in the days, there was, our guru never really uh, saw a difference between women and men. So 400 years ago, women were doing gatka. They were leading armies into battle. And as you can see, she's spinning the dos karpanna, which is the two swords. And the, obviously the aspect to that is it's sharp, right? And having in both hands means you're protecting your body all 360 around you. And there's no way anyone can get close to you. So, so they would have been sharp, but these ones are blunt, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. These <laughs> ones are blunt. Just get that clear. Just yeah. checking. Because we're, we're going to be trying out not with swords, but with other things. With the sortie, the wooden yeah. stick. Can you, can yeah. you show us what? Yep. what uh, before we do move on to that, I would like you to cover your head. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, the spiritual side yeah. is the God is off, and we want to respect that. Yep. Yeah? Okay. So, Absolutely. Okay. So, so it's really important to have to cover our heads because yep. the, because the weapons are the actual God. God. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just what do this. What have you got for me? Something very bright I can see. <laughs> <laughs> Is this going to suit me? It no, it doesn't. You Be look polite. fabulous, Sean. You look fabulous. You actually look really good. Thank <laughs> you. It actually really suits you. <laughs> This doesn't, does it? Okay, what weapon okay. are you going to choose? Well, I'm going to go for the sword. Oh, no, they're going to give me this, uh, okay. aren't they? So, this What's is called this? a sorti. Sorti. It's made out of wood, and the padding actually protects your hand at the same time. Okay. So, oh, the yeah, idea but... is, yeah, you want to stand in an L shape, right foot okay. forward, left okay. foot facing, that way, yep. And you know she's quite aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> no, there will be not. no just, fun. Time. Just mind my nails. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it's an imaginary X in front of you. I just want you to draw right, that X. Right, so yep. Like that. Okay. And Woo. perfect. Yep. Right. That's it. Oh, oh my she God. is aggressive. See, yeah. I told you. <laughs> oh, 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 Good. Oh, I think I'm going to go freestyle. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, that was steep. I think we're going to have to stop there. Yeah. The, the look in her eyes says that she's going to take me out, I think. Yeah. I'm going to step in this one. Yeah, yeah. take these off you before yeah, I think it's hurt. important that we leave it to the experts. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need a few more lessons. Well, talk for yourself. <laughs> Many thanks to all our guests and, of course, to you at home for your contributions. We'll see you all next week, but until then... Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>